thank you so much and and let me uh, echo Russell's acknowledgement of, of country and um, say what an honour it is for me to be here. Just coming up to the end of my first year in Canberra, um, reflecting on the sense of community that I've found since being here um, and to be among friends and colleagues and uh, recognising the contribution of the John James Foundation to our academic community here and, and particularly the contribution of Tony Ayres has been uh, just such an honour and a pleasure. So I've been given a... a a large topic in a short period of time, um, but we'll talk for a few minutes uh, about some of the things we think we know about cancer, um, why some of those things are not quite uh, as true as we think they are, um, and some of the work that I and, and many other people have done um, on my team uh, to, to address some of those issues. Um, the mask is actually a symbol of community. It's from Benon in what's now um, southern Nigeria. Um, and some of the other significances of that mask will, I think, become clear, or I hope become clear over the next few minutes. This call to action really is, is the frame for, for what I want to talk about for the next 15 minutes or so. This is the Lancet Commission uh, on Global Oncology and a report that they issued just a few months ago calling for urgent action to curb what they describe as a growing crisis in cancer and incidence and mortality across the world. And, and by that, they mean in, in resource-limited countries or what we might have called um, developing countries. And so over the next few minutes, I hope to talk to you about the work we've done over the last decade or so um, to address that. Uh, to talk about the work we hope to do here in, at the ANU and across Canberra in the future, um, and then maybe to, to reflect on some of the ways in, that, ways in which that work um, can contribute back here to Canberra, to our academic community, um, and, and to the development of the community here. I started out by saying that many of the things we think we know about cancer are not right, and in fact some of the things we think we know about uh, resource-limited countries are not right. We, we tend to think of cancer like heart disease as being a disease predominantly of wealthy countries. Um, and we tend to think of the burden of disease that's most significant in poorer parts of the world being mostly related to things like infection. Um, and I hope that, that this slide and the ones after it will begin to persuade you that that's, that's actually not the case. Um, this is World Health Organization data, um, and it's data showing a premature mortality due to cancer. Um, and so that's deaths due to cancer up to the age of 50, although this graph would actually look very similar if it was up to the age of 60 or so. Um, and I think you'll be struck immediately uh, by the regions of the world that are most affected by early deaths due to cancer. Clearly, in our own part of the world, Indonesia, uh, through to Indochina, very significant burdens of early death. Um, and immediately you'll be struck by the, by the burden in sub-Saharan Africa. And so while we think of cancer as being, in our own country, a disease of older people, most cancers occur after 60 and most cancer deaths occur after the age of 70, the face of cancer in much of the world is very different. Um, it's a young person, maybe starting a family, beginning to contribute to their community um, and setting out in life. Um, and it's, it's that face of cancer that I think is easy for us to forget, but is really the focus of our work. The other thing that I think will become clearer as we talk over the next few minutes is that often this is a double burden of disease because many of these cancers are related to infection. And much of this burden, particularly in Africa, um, is driven by the impact of the HIV epidemic over the last 20 years. Um, and so in many cases, these diseases in, interact with each other to give us the, the, the significant burden of disease we see today. That's around 7 million deaths annually. Uh, and to put that into context, that's as many deaths as are attributable to HIV, tuberculosis and malaria combined. Um, those oh. are the big three of global health. Um, that's a burden that's projected to double over the next 20 years and in fact has doubled in the 20 years looking back. When we think about that burden, we then have to ask ourselves, what resources are we bringing to bear on this problem? And so when I say to you that these are the proportions of cancer cases uh, that occur in resource limited settings, 60% of cases, 70% of deaths, and this is at all ages, um, and less than 2% of our research funding in cancer is directed to those challenges. And in fact, probably even less of it is spent in those countries. So we have a huge disparity that's driven, as I say, in part by the fact that our understanding of the burden of diseases is, is a little overly influenced by where we live. Um, and we have a huge challenge to, to address this, this burden of disease. And I think it's very easy faced with a disease as complex as cancer and thinking about countries that are as limited in their resources as some of these countries in Africa and Asia. It's very easy to think that this is a challenge that we can't take on or a challenge that perhaps is, is beyond our generation, a challenge for the future. Um, and so I wanted to, to step back and think about 
a challenge of similar complexity that actually we've met over the last 20 years. Um, and that's the challenge of HIV treatment. Because if we go back 20 years, the face of HIV was actually very similar to the face of cancer today. Drugs were very expensive. They were very complicated. They often required specialized testing, which was not readily available to determine the right drug for a person. And yet over the last 20 years in resource limited countries, the proportion of people who are on effective HIV treatment has gone from less than 1% to 80%. And in fact, if we go now to Southern Africa, many of those countries have a more effective, more complete rollout of HIV treatment um, than, for example, the Southern United States. So what, what led to that success and what can we learn from that success? First, and, and it, not just in honour of the award, um, translational science and a substantial investment in understanding the disease and in taking that understanding into the clinic. Secondly, a really relentless focus on making therapy simpler and cheaper. And so a recognition that moving a therapy from $100 a year to $50 a year meant that twice as many people could be treated um, within the setting of available budget. Thirdly, a parallel investment in human capacity. So that's healthcare capacity in those countries. And also a pragmatic approach to that, recognizing that not all of this care can be delivered by doctors. We need to lean on nurses. We need to lean on other people in these communities to deliver care. And each of those themes I'll return to over the next few minutes. And finally, advocacy. And I think one of the, the real strengths of the response to HIV was a global sense of advocacy and a sense very strongly, uh, even in wealthy countries, that advances in wealthy countries needed to be applied across the world. I think all of those lessons are, are modern lessons for us as we think about cancer. And as I go through, I will acknowledge the people who did the work that I'm going to talk about, but I'll start by acknowledging um, two great leaders of the HIV response who were great mentors of mine, um, Bob Yashuan uh, at the National Cancer Institute, with whom I did my PhD, um, and the late David Cooper, who was a leader of the HIV response, um, not just here in Australia, but around the world, and in fact, the first person to take the International HIV Conference to Africa. And I think their work and the work of others like them has really set a template that, that we can all learn from. This is sort of a reflection um, on one side of the slide on what simple, cheap and effective looks like. Um, for those of you who've traveled across Africa or across Asia, um, everywhere you go, there's a Peugeot 504. You, you, can, you can get to market in it, you can use it as a taxi, you can transport across. And it's, I think, a, a wonderful ad reflection of what an effective response to a difficult environment looks like, because th this is not a bullet train. This is not a $100 million light rail. Um, or whatever the light rail is actually costing. Um, but this is a very effective transportation response in limited resource settings. Um, it's cheap, it's durable, it can be fixed in that environment. Um, and as a result, you can get around these extremely you know, complicated countries. And so I tend to think when we set out to think about cancer therapies, the question is, what's the, what's the Peugeot of cancer treatment in Africa? What's, what's as simple as that and as durable as that and as easy to use as that, that you could, you could take out treatments um, and, and, and use them in, in that sort of environment with that sort of um, limited infrastructure? Cancer is a little bit different from HIV. It is, of course, many diseases, not one disease. And so we focus our attention um, and, and have done in the work I'll tell you about on a relatively small group of those cancers that are particularly important um, in resource limited countries. So these are cancers that uh, are high burden cancers, high incidence cancers that cause a lot of deaths. Um, and predominantly those are cancers caused by infectious agents. So that includes human papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer and, and other um, cancers, uh, capsisarcoma herpes virus, which causes um, the, sar the sarcoma for which it's named, um, and a number of other viruses which cause lymphomas. And we focus very heavily on treatments that can be delivered orally. Um, so they don't require a cold chain. They don't require an infusion setup. They don't require a specialized pharmacist. Um, and particularly on therapies that act on the immune system, because really this is where um, the transformation in cancer care has occurred in the last um, 10 to 15 years or so. And those therapies are particularly applicable to these high burden um, infectious agents, uh, cancers that we're, we're interested in. This is a little bit of a sense of what that translational pipeline looks like. Um, Russell opened by talking about um, that, that interface from, from the bench uh, through to the clinic. And, and over the next couple of minutes, I'll talk just very briefly about projects that sit at each point here. But we're incredibly fortunate here at the ANU 
um, to have uh, alongside my own group uh, the support of some fantastic laboratory groups, particularly the, the Centre for Therapeutic Discovery, and some of you will see that sort of through the windows, you're getting coffee, um, but other wonderful labs here at the ANU and, and laboratory colleagues across the country. Um, we're also well supported by statistics and, and, and the other things that we need to develop trials. Building on that foundation of laboratory science, at the very earliest stage of trial development, um, we've run those trials, first of all, in Australia and, and secondly, across other sort of uh, well-resourced parts of, of Asia and, and particularly in, in, uh, in uh, Singapore and in Tokyo. Um, and I hope there's a very a sort of optimistic dot there on, on Canberra. I hope to be able to do some of that early phase work in Canberra um, as we develop early phase facilities at the Canberra Hospital. And then as those drugs pass through early stages of development, as we get more confident in them and we really want to test how they're working, um, we've been able to run large scale trials across Africa and Asia. And we do that um, here at the ANU in collaboration with colleagues, um, particularly at the UK Medical Research Council. And in my previous role, as you'll see as we go, we did that in, in collaboration with colleagues at the US National Institutes of Health. You'll see that each of those arrows goes in both directions. And one of the key points um, about the work I'll talk to you about and the key points about translational science um, is it's not just a question of bringing work from the lab out into the clinic. These trials generate clinical samples. They give us an opportunity to understand the disease, and those samples can flow back into the, into the lab and give another cycle of, of translation. Um, so that, I think, has been a model for us. There's an obvious deficiency, though, in, in this model, and I'll come back to it right at the end of the talk. Um, and the deficiency is very much that the, the highest complexity science is still occurring in countries like Australia and the UK, um, and one of the things that we focus on as we do this work is thinking about how we can develop that sort of science in Africa, in Asia. Um, we're not there yet, but I will talk a little bit about what we're doing um, in that direction. The first project I want to talk about really, really spans two of the most important cancers um, in, in the developing world, um, and it's, it's a group of trials. So What's shown here uh, on the left um, are lesions caused by Kaposi sarcoma, um, which is a, a tumour I think familiar to many people from the early days of the AIDS epidemic. It was you know, a very prominent symbol of the AIDS epidemic uh, 20 or 30 years ago, um, but still now an extremely common tumour in Africa. In fact, the most common tumour in men in sub-Saharan Africa, and again, predominantly occurring in people in their 30s and 40s. A series of translational studies, mostly done um, by other groups, demonstrated that one of the key characteristics of KS is that it's extremely responsive to changes in the host immune system. So most people infected by a sarcoma herpes virus, which causes this tumour, will never have a problem. But if their immune system is damaged by HIV, um, by medications that we might use, for example, for autoimmune disease or after a transplant, they become much more prone to develop KS. And so the beginning of this sort of story that I'll show you over the next few slides was a question that we asked ourselves when I was a postdoc still at the NCI, which is if damage to the immune system is so important in the development of KS, could an approach to stimulate the immune system be effective in its treatment? Um, and we were asking this question about 10 years ago when immunotherapy was really right at the beginning of its, of its um, what's now a, a, a renaissance. Um, and we looked for all the reasons I've described for something that would be uh, deliverable in the regions where the, the burden of KS is the greatest um, and came to this drug called pomalidomide, um, which is used in Australia for multiple myeloma um, and some other tumours and is known to target many of the proteins that I've mentioned here, including IL-6 that are important um, in KS development and known to stimulate T cells. And we knew that T cell um, function was extremely important in the development of KS. And so the first trial I'll show you about um, was a single arm trial. So it sits in the middle of that, of that uh, three part graph that I showed you, an early phase trial that we conducted in the US when I was a postdoc um, and published around five, six years ago now, giving people with Kaposi sarcoma that hadn't responded to other treatments um, a course of 12 months of, of that tablet at the standard dose. Um, and I think you'll see, I, I won't take you through the waterfall plots, um, but I think you'll see pretty pretty strikingly in the, the individual who's pictured there, the sort of rapidity of the responses that we saw. Um, you see this very destructive lesion that was actually quite painful. And even at four weeks, you see that lesion regressing. By 24 weeks, that lesion's completely gone. Um, and in fact, the point that the waterfall plot's making is that that was, that was a typical response on this study. More than three quarters of people on this study responded. Um, so this was actually the beginning of work that we continue to this day. Um, it's, it's a source of great pride for me and the people who worked on that trial because um, this study that I mentioned here in JCO was the basis 
two years ago now um, for the Food and Drug Administration in the US granting accelerated approval to pomalidomide for Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, that was actually the first drug approved for Kaposi's sarcoma in 25 years, um, which again speaks to the disparity, if you like, the, um, the gap in the investment in that disease versus its burden. Um, and, it's, and it's a source of real satisfaction to see that, that drug now being used uh, in countries like the United States and Australia for KS. Um, but as I said, the burden is not in the US or, or Australia predominantly, the burden is in Africa. And so um, the next steps for us in collaboration with our colleagues um, in the UK is to start thinking about how this treatment might be useful for people with KS in Africa. There are some particular complexities. In particular, um, it's it's a difficult drug to give um, for women because it's it's a teratogen, and and of course, young women are often falling pregnant. And so, it's been a long process for us that began before COVID, and and that I I now continue to think about how that trial might work. But I think a, a, a piece of work that we hope to begin in the next year or so that'll bring us right to the end of that of that um, three part goal that I set out to bring to bring this work um, to the places where it's needed most. In parallel with that, while I was doing my PhD in the States, a great friend of mine was working uh, here at the Kirby and working on another virus that causes cancer, human papillomavirus. One of the interesting things about human papillomavirus is that it causes cancer very slowly and you can see the path by which it's causing cancer. And that's what the picture on the left is showing um, is a progression from normal uh, epithelium through dysplasia to, to finally cancer, um, commonly cervical cancer, but there are cancers at other parts of the genital tract that are important as well. I um, mean, Winnie Tong, who's shown in the top right, was able to show in a studies um, done in clinical samples um, in, in Sydney uh, that one of the key determinants of whether people were moving from normal skin to cancer, and particularly whether they were moving from those precancerous lesions back to normal mucosa, was whether they were mounting an effective T cell immune response to HPV. And so this was sort of the translational seed, if you like, for the work. Um, the, that she and I did together with colleagues while I was at, um, at the Kirby Institute in Sydney, because I saw these data showing that T cell responses were important in regression of, of HPV lesions. I thought of the data we had with pomalidomide and Kaposi's sarcoma, and I thought, well, really, this is an opportunity to, to get in and treat a cancer before it's even really a cancer, to treat something that's on the way to being a cancer. And we were very fortunate to be able to run this study um, at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney, uh, which has a wonderful early phase unit, um, to use pomalidomide at a much, much, much lower dose than we'd used it to treat Kaposi's sarcoma. Um, because these, these people haven't fully developed cancer, we didn't want to give them a full dose of a cancer drug. Um, and what you'll see here is a really striking set of responses as these lesions regressed um, with, in this case, just six months of HPP treatment. The second important thing on this graph is that we stopped the treatment at six months. But if you compare the orange bars to the red bars, you'll see that actually the lesions kept on getting smaller. Um, oh. And in fact, if we look at the immune response, you'll see that we were inducing a stimulation of T cells directed at HPV, and that's what's shown on the far right, that was lasting even after we removed the drug. And so in some ways, this immune modulator had not only induced regression of these lesions while it was being given, but it maintained that T cell population that was controlling these lesions at least out to 12 months. And in fact, those responses continued. And so for us, again, this is a really exciting step forward. This is the first medication ever to be shown, um, the first systemic medication ever to be shown to, to be effective in these lesions. They're usually treated with surgery um, and, a, and a step that we really want to take forward. And so in the next few months here from the ANU with, with collaborators at Canberra and elsewhere, we'll start looking at this in, in more advanced stage PV tumours, again, with the goal of gradually bringing that, that treatment to, to Asia where HPV is very common and to Africa. And I should mention David Van Bockel and Carmela Law, um, who were the people who really led this study, David in the lab and um, Carmela in the clinic. The next project I want to talk about, and before we start to come to some broad themes to wrap up, um, was led by Neela Darren um, with Paul Yeh. So Neela ran the clinical side and Paul Yeh at the Peter Mac ran the lab side. And was really driven by that relationship that I mentioned early on between HIV and cancer. And so the, the most common explanation for the increased rates of cancer that we see in people with HIV, um, whether in Africa or here in Australia or the US, has been that HIV is very damaging to the immune system and that the immune control of cancer is, is diminished as a result. And I think that, that explanation is true, but for various reasons, I wasn't completely convinced or we were not completely convinced that that was um, the full explanation. And we'd become aware of data around the middle of the 2010s um, showing the importance of a process called clonal hematopoiesis, which is 
essentially a process by which blood cell progenitors develop uh, genetic mutations, which give them a competitive advantage in the bone marrow niche. Sounds like a relatively dry process, but it turns out to be an incredibly important predictor of not only cancer, but cardiovascular disease and even death. Um, and in fact, if we look at people over 65 in our community, about one person in four will have clonal hematopoiesis, um, and they'll be at about twice the risk of death compared to someone of that age who doesn't have clonal hematopoiesis. This was just becoming clear when we began this trial. And so we began to wonder whether HIV infection, which occurs, of course, much earlier in life in most people, might be affecting the bone marrow niche in a way that was favouring either the development of this mutation, um, these mutations or its persistence. I um, mean, this, um, this paper, which um, Neela and Paul had uh, with all of us in Nature Medicine uh, just a year or so ago, uh, really gives the answer to that question. And what you'll see pretty quickly, first of all, is, as I've said, the blue bars, which are the HIV negative people in this study, um, have really quite significant rates of clonal hematopoiesis, and this is consistent with other studies. Um, but over all of these ages, over 55, people with HIV had about twice the rate of clonal hematopoiesis oh. as people who didn't. So something about HIV infection is really driving the acquisition of these mutations, um, driving the acceleration of them, which is what you're seeing on the far right with the slope, um, and potentially setting the stage for cancer um, and, and some of the other problems that we see um, in later life in people with HIV. This is a study that we did mostly thinking about that burden of disease in Africa. But, but the next steps of that, I think, are an example of how we might bring some of this work back to Australia um, and how some of these questions um, can, can benefit our, uh, our own community. Um, because the next trial that will begin uh, hopefully towards the middle of the year, um, in collaboration with a colleague of mine, Jürgen Sandaraja, who's at the Cleveland Clinic in the US, um, is to start thinking about how we might reverse the effects of these genetic mutations. Um, and so we'll take individuals with HIV from that study I spoke about, um, which is called Archive, um, and then other individuals with clonal hematopoiesis who are being seen in hematology clinics. Um, and we'll give them a simple oral medication that Jürgen developed um, at a very low dose that you take one tablet once a week, and we'll do that for six months. Um, this will be the first time anyone's ever tried to modify um, this process, and it's actually not clear whether it is modifiable. That's what we'll learn by doing the study. Um, but at the end of six months, we'll bring people back, we'll look in their blood, and we'll see whether the level of those mutations has changed, whether we've been able to reprogram their bone marrow in favour, if you like, um, of normal stem cells. And that'll be the first of a series of steps, which I think will probably take me through to retirement, to be quite honest, if that's successful, of working out whether this actually could be an approach not just to people with HIV, but including people with HIV to reversing some of the consequences of aging, um, including cancer and cardiovascular disease that are driven by clonal hematopoiesis, but which we can't currently address. And that the reason I've got these photos on the left is to remind me to say that's a study that we hope to be able to do here in Canberra as, as we continue to develop on the, the wonderful research infrastructure we have at the, at the Regional Cancer Centre there, and that will also run in community clinics in Sydney um, and at some of the phase one centres in Sydney and Melbourne. And I'm just going to close up by mentioning that this infrastructure that we've talked about is actually pretty adaptable. So I had hoped in the last three years to be doing that Kaposi sarcoma trial that I mentioned. And in fact, the last plane ride I took until about a week ago was to Cape Town for a big meeting we had of all of our collaborators on the Kaposi sarcoma trial. Um, and that was Australia Day of 2020. Um, and Cliff Lane, who's Tony Fauci's deputy, was with us at that meeting um, and spent most of the meeting on the phone about a new virus. Um, and I remember flying back and thinking, gosh, this will be the last time I take a 747 because Qantas was retiring their 747s at that time. But I had no idea that the reason, how right I was, that this would be the last 747 I flew. Um, but in fact, while we couldn't do that KS trial, and the KS trial is, is still, you know, hopefully in the near future, the same investment that we'd made in these trial networks, particularly with, with NIH support at that time, was the investment that enabled us to do a series of really useful trials in COVID. And, and this is one of them. Again, looking at a relatively simple therapy in the very early days of the COVID pandemic. Um, essentially, this is a therapy where we take antibodies from people who've recovered from COVID, process them, simplify them, give, and give them back at very high doses. Um, and we did that in people who were sick and who were hospitalized um, and ran this trial mostly in Africa and Asia because this is, a, this is something that doesn't need a patent. This isn't something that AstraZeneca is going to charge you or whoever is going to charge you many thousands of dollars for. This is something you can set up pretty simply at home. Um, and Eriobin Nakelu, who had done his master's with us at Kirby, ran that trial in Nigeria, and, and Christina Chang led the rollout in Indonesia. Um, and you'll see, actually, this was ineffective, and this is because I thought... Yeah, we always talk about our successes, but this was an enormous investment of time um, and it showed no benefit. Um, 
but it was important knowledge nonetheless. Many people had been treated with variations of this treatment ineffectively outside of a trial, and, and our trial was the one that showed that, in fact, um, those resources would be better used elsewhere. Um, but it was also, I think, a sign of the of the ability to harvest that investment, I mean, infrastructure for the problems that emerge, even if they're not cancer. And so I'll close up just to mention um, the importance of capacity development and of stewardship. Um, and this is one of my favourite um, proverbs, if you, if you want to go fast, go alone, and if you want to go far, go together. Um, and I think actually with the right people, you can go far and fast uh, together. Um, but this also brings me back to the deficiency I mentioned in our model earlier on, um, which is the flow of essentially high value knowledge towards less resource countries um, and the sorts of investments that we've made uh, to try and develop a situation where people in those countries can lead research, they can develop labs, they can have perhaps not the wonderful facilities we have here in Canberra, but they can have facilities that are effective. Um, and that actually brings me back to the mask that I showed you right at the start of my, of my talk, because that um, is one of the great cultural treasures of Africa um, and of what's now southern Nigeria. Um, but if you want to see the Venom bronzes, you, you can't go to Nigeria. If you want to see those bronzes, you have to go to London or New York or Paris, because that's where they are. And so when we set foot in these countries, we don't arrive without a history. We arrive with everything that's happened before. Um, and so even the process that to us might seem very intuitive of collecting samples from a patient and bringing them back to the wonderful lab we have in Canberra to do our, our assays on is actually a process that's fraught with history and fraught with politics and fraught really with identity. Um, and to put that in context, we've worked, I've worked in Indonesia now for more than 10 years. Um, and the very first time I was allowed to export a sample from Indonesia was a year ago after a, a 10 year investment in that relationship. Um, and that was in part because we had been able to show how much we were investing in developing lab capacity in Indonesia. Um, and so I mentioned this, these are examples of, of work we've done, um, mostly with philanthropic support actually, to bring young investigators to Australia to learn how to run clinical trials or to learn how to um, develop, um, develop laboratory studies. And also to bring some level of investment out to the sites where we're working so that when we leave, hopefully we leave not just with a project that we've done together, uh, but we leave with an investigator who can start to develop projects on their own and the beginnings of a lab that can start to support that work. Um, and so having outlined some of the things that will take me through to retirement and some of the things that brought me here, um, I'm very hopeful that some of the faces on this slide and some of the other young people we work with um, will be the people who nudge me off in, into retirement in a few years. Um, and that they'll be showing you slides that flow in the other direction, where work is starting in Abuja and coming here to Canberra. And so on that note, as I say, this is work done by hundreds of people, and, and it's been a pleasure to work with all of them, and a pleasure to share some of it with you tonight. Um, and I hope I haven't gone too far over time, but I'd be happy to take any questions.